Hey, so welcome to Cook Right, Eat Right for December. Our theme tonight is going to be looking at healthy holiday baking. So hopefully we're all in the mood to try some fun sweet treats. Uh, my name is Michelle Riley. I am an assistant professor here at Johnson County Community College, and I'm also a registered dietitian and do the dietary management program. Um, we're really excited to have you here. We started Cook Right, Eat Right earlier this year in partnership with the University of Kansas Health System and the University of Kansas Medical Center. So we're all really excited uh, that we can bring these presentations to you guys. Um, I'm going to introduce our first presenter. Claire Walsh. So Claire is a registered dietitian nutritionist and a certified health coach who loves to bake. Um, she often experiments with her mother's traditional southern recipes, often has success, sometimes has a con or, you know, can convert your mother. Yeah, sometimes she's fine with the results and other times she's not so interested in it. <laughs> Perfect. Well, everyone, welcome Claire. Hi. Oh, great. Oh, yes, that'll be helpful. Thank Hi everyone, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and talk about something that I really enjoy doing. Um, baking has always been kind of a hobby of mine. And my mom is from Texas, so we grew up baking together and her joke was that in the cooking classes in college, she kind of skipped out on the entree days and, and really drilled down on the baking. So she's a great baker and a pretty good cook. <laughs> so we've gotten lots of experience lots of experience and as I went through my um, education at K-State learning about nutrition and applying some of that nutrition knowledge to patients in chronic disease states I started looking at some of the things that my mom and I baked and thought hey um, there's a lot of room for improvement in these lots of shortening lots of sugar uh, so I started to do some experimenting and it's something that I've really enjoyed working with ever since, so I'm excited to have an opportunity to um, share some of that with you in my professional uh, capacity. So the goal here is to try and figure out how to put some of the ideas about healthy eating into practice in the holidays, which is ultimately a really stressful time. And we all kind of think about the holidays, baking with your children is going to be so relaxing. And I tried this with my two-year-old this weekend, and it was so <laughs> exhausting. There was flour everywhere, and she doesn't care that the um, cookie cutters like overlap and don't necessarily push all the way through. And it was, it was a lot. So, <laughs> you, I mean, we think of the holiday card with the Santa hats, um, but usually we end up somewhere closer to the, the flowered mess there. Um, but the idea is that we want to do what we can to make things a little bit better as often as possible. So modify the recipes that you currently have. And then when you're out on the holiday party circuit, focus on your favorite things. You don't have to eat everything. Not everything that's out there is going to be good. And if there's something that you don't love, you don't have to eat it. Focus your energy on the things that you really like. That's one way to really mitigate some of the, um, I don't want to say damage, but some of the extra calories that can come from holiday parties. Um, and the other thing that I really want to emphasize that I always talk with my clients about is to, you know, riff on a popular song. Try and be a little bit nicer to yourselves. <laughs> I mean, um, we are very hard on ourselves when dietary or health goals aren't met and nobody lives in a perfect world. Uh, perfection is neither a possible standard, uh, so it's a totally impossible standard. No one eats perfectly all the time, health professionals included. Health professionals are a, a large chunk of that portion of people who don't eat perfectly all the time. And as I'm sure you've noticed over the course of your lives, nutrition and health research has changed. And so not only is perfection impossible, but it's also kind of a moving target, which is really frustrating for consumers. So I like to tell everyone to think about eating on a continuum. I mean, if you're looking at apple pie, for example, maybe, or apples, maybe the fresh apple is the best choice and the McDonald's apple pie is the worst. But there are a lot of options between there. And if you are making the choice that's a little bit better than the McDonald's apple pie most of the time, then that's something that you can reward yourself for. So make the better choice as often as you can, and that, that really should be our goal. 
Um, so when we're talking about modifying recipes, that's what we're here to kind of experiment with today. And the way that I approach this is to think about what we can add first and to think about what we can replace second. So I like to try and add nutrients to the things that I bake in the form of fruits and vegetables, in the form of fiber, using different grains, and in the form of healthy fats. Um, a really great way to accomplish that is to also think about adding flavors because sometimes like our traditional, if you think back to sugar cookies, it's a pretty simple flavor profile. It's just really sweet. It doesn't make it bad, but it's just sweet. If you can add some other flavors in to that, maybe some vanilla, some cinnamon, then you get a little bit more complexity there and you don't need as much of that really forward sweetness to get a product that you're happy with. And then of course it's also important to think about replacing or reducing salt, replacing or reducing sugar, and replacing or reducing solid fats or some of the fats that we know have a negative impact on our um, blood cholesterol levels and heart health risk. So when we're talking about adding fruits and vegetables, these are some of the ways that I've done this in the past. Shredded or pureed sweet vegetables, um, or fruits to quick breads. Uh, that sounds a little bit strange, but if you think about like pumpkin bread, zucchini bread, there are lots of examples where this is actually pretty common. Carrot cakes, um, all of those things, you can kind of expand on them. So instead of making just pumpkin bread, why not make pumpkin and carrot bread? Or um, pumpkin and zucchini bread. Um, you can increase the amount of the vegetable or the fruit that you're adding to. So my mother's pumpkin muffin recipe, for example. I say muffins in quotes because it makes 12 muffins and there's two cups of sugar in the recipe. <laughs> That's a cupcake, mom, sorry. <laughs> it's an unfrosted cupcake. It's delicious, <laughs> but it's an unfrosted cupcake. So instead of the one cup, do a cup and a quarter. Um, and you're getting a little bit of extra fiber, a little bit of extra nutrients from those vegetables there. Um, master pureed or dried fruits are another great way to add flavor, add a little sweetness, and also to add some nutrients. So when you add applesauce or mashed banana or like to the pumpkin muffin recipe, um, dried cranberries, you're getting a little bit of extra flavor and a little bit of sweetness, which helps you turn down the sugar um, in the recipe too, because with those other flavors, you don't need as much sugar. Um, vegetable scraps, like broccoli stems, that's a, that's a fun little tip if you throw those into fruit smoothies. Um, it's a great way to cut down on food waste and a great way to sneak in some vegetables during the holiday season, not super well not as, quite as relevant to the baking world, but it's a really good thing to do, and it's really simple. Um, and then another thing to think about is to using herbs. Herbs count as vegetables. We eat them in a lot smaller quantities, typically, than other vegetables, but they still count. They have wonderful beneficial nutrients, just like other leafy greens do. And there are lots of recipes you can make that um, are baked goods that contain herbs. So if you think about, like, sugar cookies with uh, lemon and thyme. That's in a really classic combination. Rosemaries and apples go really well together. Um, to do kind of a variation on an apple crisp or an apple pie, adding some rosemary in there would be a really interesting way to use a little bit of extra flavor that then allows you to use less sugar in the recipe. Um, cilantro and basil mixes really well with berries. So there's lots of little tips and tricks you can do there. And I tell you, if you Google um, baking with herbs, there are a huge variety of recipes that come up that will give you lots of really great ideas. But those are some good starting places. Um, and then another thing that I, I almost always do is to double whatever the recipe says for the fruit or the vegetable. Um, in baking, you have to be a little bit more careful with that because that with extra fruit or vegetables comes extra water and that can um, that can that can change things baking wise um, but if you add a little bit extra then that certainly gives you some more nutrients and gives you some more of that great flavor some more bulk without adding extra 
sugar, extra refined flour, or extra fat. Um, the next thing I like to think about doing is adding fiber. So fiber is a really important nutrient. Uh, it's not something that we actually absorb. It's something that the bacteria that live in our colon use as their food. And the more fiber we eat, the more food the good bacteria that lives in our colon has and the more prolific they can be. And every, I swear every day when I look at my uh, journals, there's a new study about the gut microbiome and how it's so beneficial for health. So that's a really important thing that I think we're going to continue to hear a lot more about. Fiber intake um, is, a, is a great way to support that health-wise. So if you're looking at a baking recipe, what I would suggest doing is to start with about half of the flour that the recipe calls and replace it with a whole wheat flour. My preference is to use a white whole wheat flour. Um, and you can see in this picture, right? Well, I won't, that one up there. Um, there's a label on that. Um, white whole wheat flour is made from a slightly different variety of wheats. It's a little bit softer grain, and so the millers are able to grind it into a little bit finer flour. So it, it's a little bit better substitute for all-purpose flour than uh, the more coarse, regular whole wheat flour. You can certainly do it, but you're going to get a much more similar product if you use a white whole wheat flour. The other product that I really like to use when I can find it is whole wheat pastry flour. It's pretty easy to substitute whole wheat pastry flour for all-purpose or white flour in just about any recipe. Again, it's ground a little bit more finely, so the texture is going to be a lot more similar. Um, I've seen it at a handful of different stores. Um, Bob's Red Mill is the most common brand that I see that. White whole wheat flour is really common. Um, I've seen it. Trader Joe's carries their whole wheat flour. It's, it's only white whole wheat flour. Um, and then I know I've seen it at Hen House and Hy-Vee, and I'm sure they have it at Price Chopper, too. I just haven't been there in a while. Um, really, the only grocery store I've had any trouble finding whole wheat flours in is Aldi. So uh, it's pretty widely available to use. Um, and if you start with about half of the flour in the recipe, you can work up. And often, our, I'm able to replace all of the flour in the recipe with the whole wheat flour and not see a huge um, decrease in the quality of the product. Uh, another thing I like to do is to substitute flax meal for some of the flour. Um, it depends a little bit on how much flour is in the recipe, but um, you start with like a couple tablespoons or a fourth of a cup. Flax meal is a great source of fiber, and it's a great source of omega-3 fats, which are really beneficial for heart health. Um, <clears throat> I've gone up to half of a cup of the flax meal instead of the flour, and it was too much. <laughs> I got some complaints. But fourth cup and less, no one's ever said anything to me about it. Um, and then and you can also substitute oats or oat flour for some of the flour in your recipes as well. Um, oat flour is something you can buy. It's a little bit expensive. You can also make it at home. Um, Old-fashioned oats, put them in your blender until they are pretty fine, and ta-da, oat flour. Um, and then the other thing you can do with the fruits and vegetables in your recipes is to leave them unpeeled. The peel is a really good amount of fiber. So apples are a common apple pie. Leave some of the peel or most of the peel on. Um, apples go often into spiced bread recipes. Same thing with your zucchini bread. Leave those peels on. Then adding nuts and seeds are another great way to add some extra fiber, too. Um, sometimes I will just put them on top because my husband complains about um, nuts and his baked goods. <laughs> he doesn't want to crunch on things in a, in a cookie or a muffin. Picky, picky. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes you can get in, you know, depending on the crowd that you're making it for, you can add the nuts or the seeds into the product as well. Um, and I also like to think about replacing healthy fats. So in my mom's typical recipes, they call for shortening, which was the ingredient of the time. And now that we know a little bit more about dietary fats and health, we know that shortening is not the best choice. So um, it's not too difficult to replace shortening in recipes. 
Um, usually I, depending on what the product is, end up doing a one-to-one -one substitute with butter. The thing to think about there is that um, shortening is 100% fat, butter is 80% fat. Now if you wanted to do a little bit even more of a health focused replacement, you could think about a um, pureed avocado. Uh, you could think about replacing it with an olive oil, a canola oil, or a grapeseed oil. Um, olive oil is a nutritional powerhouse. It's got tons of omega, or not omega-3s, it's got tons of monounsaturated fats, tons of antioxidants, and we know that across the world, cultures who eat lots of olive oil have lower rates of heart disease and diabetes. So there's some significant health benefits there. And then grapeseed and canola oil are um, a little bit less expensive, uh, a lot less expensive, rather. Um, and they have a higher smoke point, so it's easier to incorporate them into recipes. Um, you've probably noticed that when you saute things at high heat in olive oil, you burn it. Um, that's not going to happen with the grapeseed or the canola oil. And in a baked product, unless the ingredient list is really small and there aren't a lot of other flavors going on, you're going to lose all the beautiful fruitiness of the olive oil when you cook it. So it's just not worth the $3 an ounce or whatever it is that you pay for olive oil now to bake it. Um, so the grapeseed and the canola oil are great options. Um, and then also think about adding flavor. So we talked about herbs and spices, those are great ones. Nutmeg, vanilla, almond, I've seen lemon extracts, peppermint extracts. When you can layer other flavors on top of a really simple product, it allows you to decrease the amount of sugar that you, uh, that you put in because it still tastes good, because it still tastes interesting. Um, citrus rinds, or so orange zest, grapefruit zest, lemon zest, those are really good options for that. Um, fresh ginger instead of like your uh, jarred pumpkin pie spice. There are some pretty simple mixes for making your own pumpkin pie spice at home, which is just a combination of cinnamon, allspice, cloves, nutmeg, ginger. I think that's it. And I've actually seeing a little bit of a difference. I think it's a stronger flavor when you make it yourself, even if you're just making it from ground spices. Um, so there's a lot of playing around you can do with that. And then the goal would be to replace the salt, the sugar, and the solid fats as much as is going to work for you. Because not only are we people trying to improve our health, we're also people who like to celebrate, and food is a big part of our celebrations. So if you're looking at this list thinking, gross, <laughs> I'm not adding uh, pumpkin or pureed carrots to my holiday treats, but I would consider decreasing the sugar. Great. That's wonderful. You've made a little bit better choice. That's all we ask you to do. Um, so with sugar or, and salt, well, with salt specifically, you can reduce by half in most recipes or completely eliminate it. Unless you're making a yeasted bread, the yeast needs a little bit of salt. Um, with sugar, you can reduce by up to about half with pretty similar results. Um, you can also substitute pureed fruits. So date paste, which sounds kind of revolting, but is actually really tasty, is a great sugar substitute. Um, I believe you can buy it at some health food stores, but it's also pretty simple to make. About a cup of dates and about a fourth of a cup of water in the blender until it gets as smooth as you would like. And you can substitute that one-to-one -one with white sugar in recipes. Um, it, there's still going to be carbohydrates. There's still going to be sugar in the date paste, but you're also getting fiber and potassium and some other beneficial vitamins and minerals. So it's not necessarily that you've made it sugar-free, but you've given yourself something along with that sweet flavor. Um, with chocolate, a little bit of instant coffee powder really brings out the flavor of the chocolate. So there again, it allows you to add a little bit less of the sweetener because the chocolate tastes more complex. Um, and then any of the other flavors we talked about previously. Um, and grapeseed, canola, olive oils are all good choices to replace uh, solid fats like shortening in your recipes. Um, when you're going to holiday parties, <laughs> it's it's a good idea to have a little have a plan. Um, so I always, not always, but I 
frequently come across people who are saying that they're going to a party or a special dinner and so they're just not going to eat anything all day before. And that is a really awful idea. Um, just truly terrible. I understand the impetus behind it, but when you arrive hungry at a restaurant or at home or to a party, your body and your mind is so focused on food, it's going to be impossible to make any of the healthful choices that you've signed up, psyched yourself up for all day. I know when I don't have a good lunch, I get home and I immediately reach for something to eat. I don't care what it is. I just need to get my blood sugar back into a range that I'm comfortable with, something in my stomach. And it totally negates my ability to say, hey, let's not snack on chocolate chips the whole time you're eat making dinner. That's not super necessary. Uh, and so if you are able to continue to eat normally throughout the day, it's going to help you make better choices when you come to those places where you kind of want to indulge. Um, and another great option is to look at all that's available before you make your plate because you're probably not going to want everything. And there you can kind of prioritize. Uh, for example, Thanksgiving, I'm kind of meh about pumpkin pie. Love apple pie. Could kind of care less for pumpkin pie. Everybody has their thing. Um, same thing with mashed potatoes. Don't love them. They're fine. I'll eat them. So I focus my efforts and building my plate on the things that I really like, focusing on my favorite things, and don't feel obligated to eat mashed potatoes or pumpkin pie just because it's Thanksgiving and that's what you do. I don't really like them. So I use my space for the things that I really love. Um, get a protein source that's going to help stabilize blood sugar, it's going to help you feel full longer, um, and then drink plenty of water. I know the physicians are going to have a little chat with all of us about um, alcohol at holiday parties, and so I'll, I'll let them focus on that too. Um, but basically, we, we just want to be a little bit kinder to ourselves. This doesn't have to be a perfection, again, impossible standard, moving target, not even worth shooting for. Do a little bit to make a slightly better choice as often as you can and you'll really be a lot further than you think. Um, we see a lot of research about health habits being a really important driver in health outcomes. That doesn't necessarily mean that those people who have healthy habits have the perfect health profiles, but the health habits of eating more fruits and vegetables, drinking water, those are the important things to remember. So be nice to yourselves. It's hard. We're all in the same boat. If it doesn't go the way you wanted it to, let it go. And try again next time. All right, I'm going to give this back to Michelle so she can uh, get the PowerPoint back. All right, um, while I'm doing that, I want to introduce Ed and Kathy Ellerbeck, who are both physicians at the University of Kansas Hospital, and they are going to talk to you a little bit about all the, the stressful emotions we may go through with eating food in the holidays. So I'm Ed, this is uh, uh, Kathy, we're glad to be here. Sorry we're running a little bit late, we're also directionally impaired, uh, but we really want to talk about some of the confusion around food around the holidays, some of the stresses are related to that, and really get into some of the things that, yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the macronutrients with uh, fats, carbohydrates, protein, and then finally alcohol. You got the, the thing? So uh, first off, uh, this is my biggest pet peeve. If you see the word or the label, low fat, just run like hell. Okay, the thing is it'll be good for your health nutritionally and the exercise of running will actually uh, uh, be good for you. Because, next slide, I, I actually have to have my uh, a slide. Uh, 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 fat, fat, fats are actually good for you, okay? And uh, so I, I, I like fats and I enjoy them. And this is sort of the, uh, the big macronutrient thing. So first off, the big killer was trans fats. We knew that trans fats were, uh, were absolutely awful. Uh, you still will see, uh, the FDA has pretty much got them out of the uh, food supply, uh, but there's still some uh, sitting on the shelves. If you see anything that says partially hydrogenated, and it's a solid fat like that, uh, uh, just put it back on the uh, shelf. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, I was picking up some peanut butter and I still saw partially hydrogenated, and they didn't have to tell you it was trans fats if they were really, yeah. 
Uh, uh, yeah, well, she hated the oily part of the, uh, uh, the natural peanut butter, uh, but anyway, uh, she's gotten used to it. it it's actually okay. Uh, but we still have uh, saturated fats, and the saturated fats uh, uh, really are used to make the solid things like the, uh, the Criscos and the margarines uh, become combinations of, of that. It's also what we see in our meats and butter, and uh, frankly, we were making our carnitas the other day, and so when we got the five <laughs> pounds of lard, uh, that's what was in there. Uh, not nearly as bad <laughs> as the, uh, as the uh, uh, trans fats, uh, but uh, they still do increase your cholesterol. Uh, uh, and they, they say they have a neutral uh, effect on your uh, heart disease, but it's actually, well, that's compared to the trans fats, uh, I think. Compared to some of the other healthier fats, they, they would actually be considered harmful. So the big thing here is, is getting into the monounsaturated and the other, other fats. When it comes to baked goods, if you could bake a big salmon, that would be the fats exactly that you uh, want. How do we put this in play? We actually put this in play with uh, uh, data that comes out of, of Spain, where they did this large study, the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease, where they substituted Mediterranean diet with either extra virgin olive oil or, or nuts. And compared to a control diet in, in Spain, I just wanted to put this, I, I was actually really intrigued in this because I was interested in sort of the healthy nutrition uh, angle. And so uh, in Spain already, you know, it's in the Mediterranean, so aren't they already on a Mediterranean uh, a diet? So what does this Mediterranean diet mean? So they gave them some education. It turns out if you actually looked at the food frequency questionnaires that they had, it really only mattered related to two things. And what they did besides training them on the Mediterranean diet, one group got a liter of of extra virgin olive oil per week per household. Okay, I wanted you to think about that. How much olive oil do you go through in a typical um, month? Do you go through a liter uh, a month? Okay, they went through a liter a week uh, in, in their stuff. So, they, I mean, you can imagine they're pouring it on there. They're using it in all of their baking. And yes, I understand it has the high, higher smoking point in center, but it, it mainly holds up uh, uh, okay. That's related to some of the phenols. Uh, but, I mean, just drinking it raw, I guess. Uh, the uh, <laughs> And then with the, uh, the nuts, now that was a half of a pound uh, per person per week. And so uh, that one maybe see, sounds a little bit uh, nicer. But so this it's is. It's got a lot of calories. So that's always in the past. It's scary. Yeah, but, you, but when, yeah, well, we thought it has lots of Well, yeah, it right. has, yeah, it has calories per volume, but that's basically because it it's full of, of, of oils. Uh, but the nice thing about it is it is a great way to curb your appetite. And if you actually get the big thing at Costco, it's relatively inexpensive. And now I will tell you, if you get the salted ones, there is sort of this salt thing that makes you want to have, have more. If you get the unsalted ones, it is just a great way of curbing it without getting that desire to have a, a lot more. But anyway, with either of those supplements, we had a 30% reduction in cardiovascular uh, uh, events. So my recommendations related to baking and fat is don't skimp on the fat uh, because low fat is a code word for high simple carbohydrates and sugars. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to the boss here to tell you about this. <laughs> oh, uh, the other thing is since we said don't use trans fats, What's the issue with the fry oil? If we actually say that you're, uh, s s you know, so in theory, oil shouldn't be bad. It sounds good. But what happens is, is when they repeatedly uh, cook it at high temperatures, those fats actually transform and start to hydrogenate and uh, start to create some other harmful chemicals. So don't reuse your own fry oil. And that's part of the reason why we really don't want you e eating a lot of uh, fried food when you eat out. OK. Um, and this was different than. 20 years ago, if you guys remember, we were all about like low fat and all of those things. So, so the sort of, uh, I have lived experience of going through all these different recommendations and being about just about every diet there was. Um, the, the thing that has changed some too is thinking about how bad sugar is for you. And, and again, that's been all the rave in the last five years, but 15 years ago, it wasn't the thing we were talking about. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, classifying carbohydrates. I thought sugar plums actually might be healthy because it sounds like a fruit. They're really a candy. They're really not healthy for you, so don't eat those. Um, I'm going to talk about glycemic index, uh, fiber content, and then some, mostly I'm going to talk about glycemic index, but fiber content matters um, as far as rapid, rapidity of absorption, and so does the form, solid or liquid. So glycemic index is the measure of the impact of a carbohydrate containing food on blood glucose. And there are foods that raise your, they, they measure it against sugar, and they take the food and see 
compared to sugar, what is the, the, uh, the height of the sugar, the, the uh, glucose peak? A low glycemic index is 55 or less, medium is 55, 6 to 69, and, and high is 70 or more. Um, some things that you would think shouldn't be really, you'd think would be healthier, have a higher glycemic index. And the, um, the issue with having your blood sugar go up quickly is you have uh, something that gets into your bloodstream quickly, uh, increases your glucose, it increases your insulin, and eventually you have problems with managing your insulin. You get hyperinsulinemic, and that is the thing that we talk about with prediabetes. You, you get increases your risk for um, going on to getting um, the high blood pressure and high and, and diabetes that um, cause a lot of problems. There's been argument about how, help, how helpful glycemic index is, and the reason is is because if you think about it, it's just not how much that food in a certain number of grams raises your blood sugar, but how much of that food you eat. <laughs> so it also takes into account, the, uh, the glycemic load takes into account the amount of carbohydrate in a common serving in addition to its glycemic index. Um, and there is an app for that. There's an app for everything. Um, <laughs> and this app uh, is, is one I actually use to sort of uh, tell me like um, how much my glycemic load is. Um, and uh, so you don't have to do all that calculation stuff on the bottom. There are a lot of factors that influence glycemic index. Um, the type of starch um, makes a difference how the f fiber is um, made and what kind of fiber it is, the sugar content, fat and protein content affect how fast things are absorbed, food processing, um, and then cooking. So there are a lot of things that do influence glycemic index, so it's hard to figure out on your own, but there are ways to actually um, take that into consideration. And I think people have heard about, well, baked potatoes, if you eat a white potato, that's not as good as if you eat a sweet potato. And that's part of that is, is the rapidity of, of how it affects your um, blood sugar. Um, there is pretty good evidence that su su uh, supports an overall low glycemic load diet. And I think that we all know this now, that the things you should eat mostly should include fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, like Michael Pollan's been telling us for years. <laughs> um, low consumption of flour-based products, um, sugar-sweetened beverages, particularly only occasionally. They're really absorbed quickly. They raise your blood sugar quickly. Try to eat healthy fats and healthy proteins. Um, I love to cook. I have a cookbook fetish. I have way too many cookbooks. Um, and a lot of them are really not healthy cookbooks, probably. Um, but there are two that I really love. One is Back in the Swing, which is a cookbook that is um, by Barbara and Bob Unell. It was actually devised um, for the breast cancer program uh, after um, breast cancer survivorship. And it really has some nice recipes that include calorie counts and fats and carbohydrates and everything. Um, not just desserts, but has a number of good desserts too. And I like it because it starts with desserts first. The first chapter is desserts. I think that's a great idea. My favorite bakery in the whole world is probably in Boston. It's the Flower Bakery. Um, and the, um, the owner of Flower Bakery actually published a cookbook, Baking with Less Sugar. Um, she did that because her husband has this sort of, he uh, sugar crashes, so he eats sugar and then he feels badly afterwards. And so, so she has devised a number of recipes that decrease the co total content of sugar, and they're still really good recipes. So, um, so I, when they said we were going to talk about baking with uh, healthy baking, I thought, I don't know if we could talk about that. This <laughs> can we do that? <laughs> and I am convinced that it can be done. <laughs> um, and Ed's going to talk about. So I finally just wanted to follow up with portion control. So when it comes to uh, the holidays, uh, one of the things is if you're a good host, you actually use small serving plates. So we tend to actually fill up the size of the serving plate we have. If we use smaller serving plates, we'll tend to eat a little bit uh, less. So as a good host, uh, don't bring out the big china. Bring out the uh, uh, the, the coffee uh, uh, saucers or something like that. Uh, that. Uh, also, your food will go far further. You'll have more <laughs> leftovers, I guess. So it uh, might, might be good. Uh, but, uh, but that serving size issue, uh, so, and what it also allows you to do is to say, okay, 
you know, your grandmother had a special recipe, you know, maybe it wasn't the healthiest thing in the world, but you have to have it for the holidays. But by using smaller serving sizes, you can still have your favorites, but just not overload on them. But the biggest thing that you have to be as a responsible host is thinking about the serving sizes related to alcohol. And for those of us on a diet, alcohol also has calories. So there's about 120 calories or so uh, per serving of alcohol in the alcohol alone. And then if you're like this uh, uh, person, uh, and then you're adding, uh, you're making your old fashioned, you're throwing in the extra sugar into it, that becomes a, a bigger problem. Uh, and so just roughly, you know, you got your 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of table wine, and one and a half ounces of, uh, of your uh, uh, bourbon or scotch or whatever it is. And so we've got lots of people who are putting two shot glasses in there. Okay, well that would be a double serving of alcohol, so about 240 calories. And also a concomitant amount of alcohol related to what you're going to do if you try to drive uh, home in the evening. Now, uh, I hate to say this because it sounds like Brett Kavanaugh, but I like <laughs> beer. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and one of the problems with liking beer is, is they've changed the beer. I, I also like the, uh, the microbrewery stuff, but now uh, uh, they, what they've done is they've really upped this alcohol content of it. And you've got to be careful because some of the beers that we'll actually have end up coming out like uh, wine. So if you look at the uh, Dark Truth Imperial Stout, you're really talking about one uh, pint of this being roughly two and a half servings of, of alcohol. So uh, be, care be careful about that. And then finally, with the wine, the part of the reason I like beer is because if it comes in a can or a bottle, it's portion controlled. Okay, I'll have two of those at a party, and I'm good for the entire three hours or whatever of the party. If I have wine, I'll try a little of this, I'll try a little of that. I have no idea how much went into the glass. I've lost track of how many glasses of it I have. And I just don't feel good, and I get her to drive me uh, uh, home. Because I can't if figure I out how much uh, <laughs> uh, five ounces actually is. So uh, when I think about alcohol and baking, you can use alcohol all you want in the baking because it turns out to be calorie free. The alcohol actually burns off during the uh, uh, baking uh, uh, process. Alcohol raw does have calories, and then that alcohol can reduce your inhibitions on your diet. So think portion control. So <laughs> happy holidays. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, now we're going to bring up Chef Allison Reed. So Allison is a pastry chef who is an instructor here at JCCC, as well as a culinary arts instructor in the Olathe School District. Um, Allison does some of our continuing ed classes as well. So if you ever want to take a more in-depth class on any of the baking or pastry, uh, look for some that she does in our continuing ed catalog. So Allison's going to demo some recipes, and I'm going to go get them so you can try them. Yes. Hello, that's the fun part. You've been waiting to eat. Um, so when Claire was talking a lot about replacing the flour, that's what I do a lot. I've got a continuing ed class on gluten-free baking. Some people who practice, or if they have celiac or they're gluten-free, they think that it doesn't taste as good, but you remember that there's still butter in it and there's still sugar in it and there's still chocolate in it. So it still tastes really good. It just doesn't have gluten in it. But gluten doesn't make it necessarily healthier for you. But I do like to replace all-purpose flour with another kind of flour a lot. So the first, I need to put this. I made kind of a simplified, an apple crisp is always what comes to my head when I think about healthy because you could make you could bake an apple. This particular recipe that you have, I've made like baked a whole apple, baked a half of an apple. Today I sliced apples and I peeled them. You don't have to peel them. That's a little more nutrients. Uh, I used all purpose flour today, but I like to use oat flour, which you can make at home by like grinding the oats. I buy like Bob's Red Mill has a lot of all kinds of flours. I like oat flour because it has a similar consistency to all purpose. Whereas if you've ever tried rice flour, it's a little bit grainy and sometimes leaves like a weird feeling in your mouth. I have recipes with buckwheat flour. Uh, almond flour, of course, is a normal one used. That's a little more expensive sometimes. And I've made my own of that before. And it, it doesn't quite, quite come out as fine as I would like. But this particular crisp, uh, the recipe I've given you is pretty tiny. 
So I think I doubled it for this. I bake it in a pan. I hate to say it, but it really tastes great with ice cream. But I also have started to learn to like Cool Whip again. So something like that with a little bit less sugar. You could also make your own whipped cream and maybe sweeten it with something other than white sugar. Maybe just a little vanilla bean, natural. I usually tell all my classes I buy vanilla bean paste. Vanilla beans can be sometimes over a dollar a piece just for one bean. The vanilla bean paste was up. It's on Amazon. A couple weeks ago, I got a small bottle here, and our purchasing person told me that was $60, and it was like five ounces. Then I had a class. We were making pies a couple weeks ago, and I said, oh, this is on Amazon, but it's $60 now. Then I looked, and it was like under 20 So if you want vanilla bean paste or vanilla beans, buy now before they go back up. But that's a nice sweetening flavor if you like vanilla. So this crisp, like I said, I peeled apples. If you don't know the trick of, they don't look, they're a little bit brown, but if you don't know the trick of adding a little lemon juice and water when you're cutting apples. I also, if I'm baking, I like Granny Smith's. I always add, put grannies in pies but I'll kind of mix it up with another red apple now, occasionally. Grannies on their own or Golden Delicious are a little bit mealy. I think I threw a couple Red Delicious in here and in the one that you're gonna eat. Uh, these have been soaking for a while, but if this is a cake pan, I will just, this is kind of like a cooking show where all of a sudden everything's already done for you. Um, so I just kind of flatten them out here. You can toss them in a little bit of flour and sugar if you're trying to keep them the consistency a little bit better that's what I do if I'm making a pie but on their own they're fine the more sugar you add the more liquidy it will be if you add any kind of sugar sweetener uh, with the crisp topping though it has enough this is brown sugar cinnamon like I said all-purpose right now I have quick oats which work fine that's just all I happen to have but I use rolled oats or quick oats quick oats are you can just kind of add liquid to these and cook them a little faster. They're tinier. So this particular crisp calls for melted butter. But I have streusel recipes or things that I put on top of my pie. That is the dry ingredients with cold butter. Cut that in and then you would sprinkle that on top of your pie or your crisp. So you could take this particular recipe and still use cold butter. But mixing everything together almost makes it more of a crumble and you can just lay that on top. This would not, you know, I bake it until the crust is kind of brown. You're not going to get a very nice whole piece of it. You'll get some apples and the crisp on the side of it because we just kind of scooped it. But I will mix everything. Everything's already weighed out because that's magic. I added a little bit extra salt. You could taste it and see if you want to add more salt. If you like a lot more cinnamon, more cinnamon. I I recommend kind of playing with all different flowers because almond flour in this would be good too. But it might end up a little bit different um, consistency. So my brown sugar has been sitting out a little bit. Whisk this all together. And then when you do add... And also do it with your hands with you have gloves on once you kind of mix in the butter then at first it's gonna seem like too much butter but once you start stirring around it'll be like a crumble in your hands and I make this this could be considered a streusel topping of course so I use this for Pumpkin bread, banana bread, blueberry muffins, anything anything that you want a crunchy top crunchy topping on. Like with pies, I'm not really a crust top person, just always streusel. You could even lower down the butter a little bit. Using oil might not be quite the same flavor, but it would be an option to trade this out. So then when I'm not caring about health and I'm making streusel, then I always tell 
students and everyone just to pile it on. But we can go light here and have, but with these apples, if you're getting a really tart apple, you might need to be tossing it in another flavor because it might just taste almost sour. But the honey crisps and the apples you enjoy eating plain, just stick with eating those plain and use kind of the cheaper sad apples maybe for baking. And the grannies are really cheap. So this would be plenty amount. This is four apples. I doubled everything that's on your recipe. And I bake until the apples get kind of liquidy. And then you can cool it. Then it would be easier to cut. Otherwise, you were getting already warm scoops of apples and crisp on your plate. So that would be the crisp that you have. The muffins, well, I'll, let me finish this first. So you may have heard of chocolate bark or peppermint bark. So we call it bark because we're literally spreading chocolate on a sheet pan and then covering it with whatever you want. So I've done toffee pieces, peppermint. Uh, we talked about doing pomegranates and pistachios today. We chose dried cherries and pistachios. You might be noticing some of your chocolate might be melting a little bit because the kitchen is abnormally hot. Usually they turn the heat off, but it's on. Um, so when I, this is 55% chocolate. The lower the percentage is, the more kind of sugar is added to it. So this would be considered about semi-sweet. Uh, the higher percentage of chocolate, because you might see on the nicer chocolates, it's labeled. So there's not a lot of sugar added. So the higher you go, the more bitter it will be. So if you really like that dark, dark chocolate, you might be up to like 80%, 90% cacao. So it doesn't have that sugar added, which is going to be better for you. This is 55. I use this for a lot of things, even in cookies and stuff. And, and the students tend to not like the darker, bitter chocolates. They're used to milk chocolate. They're used to semi-sweet. They're used to chocolate chips. So this one's pretty like a good middle ground. I just melted it over hot water. Um, when you melt semi-sweet chips or anything, if you've ever tried to melt chocolate at home and it gets a little like clay-like, you just need to buy better chocolate. <laughs> I mean, that's just like you try to microwave chocolate, that's burning up real easily. So this is just melted chocolate. And I've spread it on a sil pat, a silicone. If you guys have one of these at home, parchment will work, but it might get a little wrinkly. Then I put the toppings on it. Then I threw it in the fridge really quick so it would set up so I could break it up and you could try it. A whole nother class would be explaining tempering chocolate to you, but if you've ever heard about it, you're heating up chocolate and then you're adding whole pieces of that same chocolate to bring the temperature back down and have it set up and it's not gonna melt in your hands. I know if you hold on to like a Hershey's bar long enough, it will melt, but if it's sitting, and if it's in the sun, but it doesn't melt like, say, the chocolate you have right now is melting on the plate. Also, if you've ever seen chocolate with a bunch of white spots on it, that's called blooming, which means the chocolate wasn't properly tempered wherever it came from. I didn't temper it today because I'm showing you how you might do it at home, and like I said, tempering is quite a lengthy process sometimes and you have to have your temperature just right and you can take the temperature of your chocolate depending on milk white dark it, it'll be a different temperature so there is I mean I could probably host a whole class in tempering but if you have more questions about it it's definitely on the internet but I do have a handout I could probably find for you so after I melt I'll spread right on the sheet the bark that you have is fairly thin because I wanted to make sure we made enough of it but you really could go at this point it's ideal that it's all even and this is I mean I melted like two pounds of chocolate so that's quite a bit and depending on where you're buying your chocolate you might not want to be spending too much money on it but like Ghirardelli or something that they have in the box, like I use that. So I'm just making it pretty even. This is thicker. 
Also, if you know how to make toffee, like crunchy toffee, I've made that. I know I'm going off into sugar world. It's hard for me, but toffee, then spread a layer of chocolate on it. Um, but here, the darker you go, the better it will be. And fruit, I mean, dried apricots, dried fruit for sure. Uh, nuts, peppermint. You don't necessarily have to. So I would sprinkle on these dried cherries I did cut up, but they're a little sticky. And I just sprinkled on and I will throw it in the fridge. Even if you tempered it, you can throw it in the fridge. It will eventually set up because when you temper chocolate, you can see it starting to set up just out in a room temperature. But you can throw this in the fridge, break it up. If it's thick, it's not going to melt as fast. You're throwing it in a tin to give to someone. It's pretty simple. And they like, it really knocks people's socks off even though all you did was melt chocolate and add some fruit to it. Uh, I didn't read, these aren't super salty, but I mean, peanuts, like pretty much anything. And then I would throw this in the fridge. But like we said, pomegranates would have been prettier. But uh, I like the combination of cherries and pistachios. And the muffins that you have in front of you and the recipe, that could also be, I, I would also recommend oat flour to try with those because of its consistency. You can tell that since it's sweetened with honey, it's not quite as sweet. Of course, sometimes I think, oh, you might need extra, like you imagine cream cheese frosting or something on it, but you could find some other additives and even applesauce in this would be pretty good too. Instead of the pineapple, if you didn't like that, but pineapple helps keep it moist. Uh, our family carrot cake recipe is made with pineapple and oil instead of butter. So, it, but there's also two cups of sugar in that recipe too, just like yours. Shredded carrots, because uh, I know that's what makes it good, but the oats will keep holding together that consistency as well. And this would be really good with zucchini. And then maybe some really dark chocolate chips. Uh, zucchini bread and chocolate chips is good. I make my pumpkin bread with chocolate chips and banana bread. So it's something different to try if you haven't already tried that. I think, I think that's all I have for now. I've got to throw this in the fridge and this one in the oven. Well, thank you, Chef Reed. We really yeah. appreciate it. Um, we are really excited that we are going to uh, continue our partnership for Cook Right, Eat Right next year. Um, and we have set our first date for February 13th, uh, so right before Valentine's Day. And we'll talk about heart health so you can bring your you know, sweetheart and we'll talk about heart health for a nice, fun Valentine's date. I can't think of anything more romantic than that. Uh, so we're really excited to have you, have you there. But thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>